it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure here to introduce uh, the moderator for, for the next panel, uh, and that's uh, the Vice President for Research for the George Washington University, Dr. Leo Chalupa, who became university's first Vice President of Research in 2009, and, and through the force of his vision and personality has basically transformed the university. Uh, university's research enterprise. So I'm, I'm really uh, delighted to have uh, Leo with us, and Leo will go and introduce the other members of the panel who are here. Uh, with, with him, I think, are Dr. Keith Crandall and Frank Stein from IBM. Well, good morning, everybody. So sorry about the bathroom break. Um, <laughs> so you all saw these books, uh, these little red books. Uh, this is a tain that Greg provided. I, I thought it had the, the sayings of Greg Baroni, but when you open it up, it's empty. <laughs> so I'm not exactly sure what that means. And by the way, the book is made in China. <laughs> so let me introduce the, uh, where is our third panelist? We're short of panelists. Oh, one more. Where's Gary? Where's Gary? Bathroom break? <laughs> All right, well, uh, so, um, Come on down, don't be shy. <laughs> so uh, let's get going. Uh, I want to just introduce the, the panelists and um, then ask them to tell you a little bit about their background and specifically to address the question, how did they get into this business of big data and analytics? Just, you know, uh, three to five minutes max, okay? so. To my left is Keith Crandall, uh, who's the uh, first and founding director of our Computational Biology Institute. This is one of the three big data institutes that uh, Steve Knapp mentioned in his Dr. Remarks. Uh, we're, we're very glad that uh, Dr. Crandall is here. He's done a tremendous job in uh, putting us on a map in this very important field. He hired a number of people who are getting funded, grant funded, uh, from external sources. Uh, to his left is now uh, Gary Schiffman, who is president and CEO of Giant Oak. He's also an, an adjunct professor at um, Georgetown uh, University. And to his left is Frank Stein, the director of um, Analytics Solutions Center in IBM. So, so why don't we? So we have three people from very different kinds of um, fields, in a sense. Uh, Keith being mainly academic, uh, but he also is an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, Dr. Schiffman is uh, in a small type company, and he also has a foot in academics. And then finally, uh, Frank Stein is in a rather large company. <laughs> and uh, so it would be interesting to see the different experiences on the topic on, on, uh, that we're going to be discussing, which is growing the big data workforce. So Keith, why don't you, why don't you start and tell us, how did you get into this business? And, and uh, a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, at least a few of you will be glad to know that I come from a statistics background, right? <laughs> I double majored in math and biology at a small place called uh, Kalamazoo College in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, and had this dual interest in math and biology and found a field called population genetics that really put them together nicely and, and like the difference between uh, statistics and big data analyst, uh, where it's effectively the same, except you get paid more as a big data analyst. Uh, I quickly discovered as the field of bioinformatics was developing uh, that you had that same difference in, in if you called yourself a bioinformatician as opposed to a population geneticist, you gotta jump in pay, <laughs> even though you're doing the same thing. So I quickly became a bioinformatician uh, and uh, capitalized on, on those skill sets of, of, of math and biology with a little bit of uh, computer programming. So um, I've always had an interest in, in analyzing data and making sense of it, especially genetic data. And as our ability to collect genetic data uh, evolved into our ability to collect genomic data, um, all of a sudden I was in the big data game, right? Because uh, my data sets went from being uh, 250K data sets to 20 gigabyte data sets uh, that gave out a, a terabyte of information after I was done analyzing it. So uh, got into the big data by uh, being in biology in the genomics era. Thank you. Gary. Thanks. So. Um 
I came into big data uh, maybe a little bit differently. Um, started out thinking about uh, problems of human nature. Um, psychology major went into the military and started working on national security. So I've got this interest in human behavior, human activity, and, and, and national security issues. Um, get a PhD in economics, right? So economics is the science of human decision making, right? So what I've been doing for the past 20 years or so is modeling human behavior, specifically human behavior as it relates to um, illicit activities, illicit behaviors, illicit organizations, working in the, you know, the Northern Virginia uh, area government. I've been in and out of government, um, in and out of industry and academia. Um, so what I'm doing now is, well, I'm on, I'm on faculty at, uh, can I say Georgetown in this room? Is that okay? <laughs> Um, One of the Georges. Yes, right. <laughs> One of the universities in the area. So I've been on faculty at Georgetown for 13 years now, where I teach in the graduate program in national security, national security studies. And Giant Oak, my company, is um, doing both the theory and the empirical work as it relates to going through what today we call big data, and looking for the, the signal and the noise, looking for the indications of illicit activity, behaviors, and networks. Um, so I came to it through this uh, query and drive to understand human behavior, specifically as it relates to bad guys. Um, got a PhD in economics, and, uh, and now uh, I'm in big data. Thank you. Frank. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm the computer scientist of the group here. Uh, I've been at IBM for 32 years. I started off doing modeling and simulation for interesting federal kind of problems. Uh, that evolved to doing a lot of programming because some of you may be old enough to remember the old days when we had to actually program mm -hmm. uh, to do modeling and simulation. So I did a lot of modeling and simulation, actually writing Fortran programs uh, and various other uh, you know, computer science kind of things. Uh, and most recently, I've uh, now lead one of IBM's eight uh, analytic solution centers around the world. So I run the one here in the Washington, D.C. area focused on public sector problems and how do we apply analytics and big data uh, to those kind of problems. And so we get involved not only in the statistics and predictive modeling and the optimization, uh, but also the, the uh, computer science kind of work behind that. Uh, how do you get the computers to hold all the data? How do you process all that information in a quick enough manner that it can be used uh, for decision making? Okay, so that gives you some information about the folks that are up here. I should just say about myself, uh, I don't do big data. I do big administration now. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I, for many, many years, I, I was a, a brain researcher and neuroscientist at um, University of California, Davis, before coming here. And, and certainly in, in, in neuroscience and brain research, you can really see the impact and the importance of big data. I'll just give you one example. A standard method, uh, people won a prize for this, would be to record from one cell in the brain and look at how the cell responds, for example, to visual stimuli. And uh, so you'd record from this one cell of 100 billion cells in the brain for an hour or two and see what it responds to, then go on to another cell, another cell. And a typical study, uh, would publish in leading journals like Science and others would maybe contain 200 cells, each one individually studied like this. Now uh, you can put in a thousand electrodes at once and record from these thousand cells from computer generated stimuli. And not only does it give you data for each cell, but now you have to look at correlations among these thousand cells at the same time and how they respond. So you can imagine all of a sudden the complexity and the richness of the kind of data you have. So big data is certainly a big part of neuroscience today as well. So, so let, me, let me begin the discussion this way. Uh, one of the, the take-home messages, I think, from uh, this wonderful talk by uh, yeah. Dr. Chimura and, and her, and her, and her um, report, which I, which I urge all of you to look at because it's very detailed and rich in information. But one of the take-home messages there is that there's a talent gap, as you heard her say, between uh, what companies uh, ostensibly would like and what is being produced by, by universities. 
And for people of a certain age here, you might remember that we used to ha talk about another gap, the missile gap. The country was in a frenzy about that, and we know how that turned out. Um, so my question is this, for the three of you working in very different areas, on a personal level, have you experienced this talent gap, yes or no? And if so, in what way? So that's not kind of anecdotal stuff, right? I'm not questioning the data, but I just want to get a personal impression from each of you. Why don't we, why don't we start in the middle here? Yeah, thanks. So uh, absolutely, it's, um, it's, it's very, uh, very, very real to me. I've got a small company. Um, we're, uh, we're growing uh, very quickly because the demand for, for uh, big data and analytics is so strong in the area. Um, I gave, let me just start with an anecdote. I gave a job offer to uh, employee number 14 <laughs> this past week. And he sent me a note last night saying that Google wants to fly him out for a visit and would I hold the job open for him until after he hears from Google. Um, so I'm going to write him off. But um, <laughs> two, two months ago, I had another candidate um, refuse, uh, uh, turn down a job because um, uh, um, Facebook is creating a data science team and they're starting to hire the exact same people that I hire. So I tend to hire uh, PhDs, um, you know, pretty uh, young uh, PhDs with good software skills, right? As opposed to software engineers, I'm looking for uh, folks with the intuition and the scientific method, but also who can do the coding themselves or at least most or a lot of the coding themselves. That's who I'm looking for. That's who Facebook is looking for. That's who Google is looking for. And I don't pay as much as they do because like most of you, my, my contracts are tied to federal government contracts and federal government salaries. And so that's what I can offer to people. And, um, and it's tough. Yeah. Okay, Frank, what about your experience at IBM? We hire a lot of people in the data science area, as you would imagine. Uh, we don't have quite the same problem competing with the Googles and the others, um, uh, but we do have trouble getting the right talent. And I think you know that's part of the the message here is not only do we need people that know how to analyze the data, but we need to know have people that can work with the data. And as you pointed out, a lot of that is the the computer science the the work of actually ingesting the data so that you can analyze it. It's not the sexy part of the job, perhaps, but it's a necessary part of the job. So do we have the people with the right hybrid skills that both can understand the data and know how to manipulate the data and also know the computer science side so they can use the, they bring the data in and uh, actually process the data? Keith. From, from an academic perspective. Right, so uh, on the academic side, I'm on the good end of this problem, right? Because uh, yeah. we teach these students and train these students and then watch them get sucked up and competed for by industry. So it's a good position to be in. Uh, and in fact, um, before I came here, my previous position, I directed a, an undergraduate program in bioinformatics uh, where we developed the program by going out and talking to the biotech industry, right, and asking the biotech industry, what, what kind of skill sets do you need? Um, what, what's, what kind of graduating student would you like to see? What skill sets do they need? What abilities do they need? And then we went and asked graduate programs the same questions, right? And unlike this survey where um, the education and the, and, and the business people were kind of had different priorities. Here they had the same priorities, at least the biotech industry, which is very narrow compared to what we're talking about today, and the graduate programs in bioinformatics and computational biology. And they all wanted kids who had experience, database experience, right, SQL kinds of database management experience in analyzing data. They wanted some programming experience, typically scripting or Java or C kind of experience. So we developed a curriculum that did that, right? Gave those kids those skill sets. And as a consequence, you know, our kids graduating uh, had all kinds of options. A lot, so that half of them would go to graduate programs, but the other half would get, uh, about a quarter of them would go on to professional schools, lawyers, uh, business school, um, dentists, pre-meds. Uh, but then a quarter of them would get hired straight away. Uh, and we had one year, we had Microsoft hired three of these kids um, all at like 80, 
in the mid eighty thousand dollar a year salary range as an undergraduate with no experience. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. Because they had the skill sets, because they could manipulate data and they could write scripts and they could not just analyze the data. And our program did have a good robust statistics program because uh, because I have that background and, and uh, uh, sorry for the physicist, but I trashed, I didn't, I don't like physics, so <laughs> I, I jettisoned the physics, no offense Ali, <laughs> I jettisoned the physics in favor of statistics because uh, I felt <laughs> you have to give up something, right? And I felt that was more relevant to the, to the data analytics. Go ahead, Gary, you want to say? So, so I want to uh, b build on that, and again, I've, I'm a part academic and, and industry person, and I want to build on a, a comment that the gentleman made earlier. First, first of all, I want you to know that I took my graduate econometrics class at GW, because it, it was a better class, thank you, yeah. That accounts for your success. Yeah, yeah. That's right, I owe it all, I owe it all. Um, the, the comment about big data and being domain specific and how we haven't really gotten into that um, I would love for that to be one of the takeaways for everybody today because we talk about big data as if it's generic and I think big data or, or analytics are, are best domain specific, right? So uh, in the national security field, um, I see people with um, computer science skills or maybe an electrical engineering background doing big data and making terrible mistakes in the meaning of the output or in the interpretation. And then the analytical workforce that uh, populates all of the government agencies around us, they're really smart with um, bachelor's degrees in history, right? And we're taking these people and we're putting them in front of terabytes of data, right? So we've got this huge gap where the people who know how to manipulate terabytes of data don't really get to the right questions to ask. The people who have the domain and the analytic capabilities don't have the tools yet to, um, to do the right things in front of terabytes of data. I think where technology is today is we can visualize the data. We give, we give these analysts with a history degree um, a great visualization of the data, and I think over and over we're drawing the wrong conclusions from that. And I think that's the gap. It's, it's, I think we, we're, we're better off talking about it in specifics as opposed to just sort of in general sort of big data skills. Okay, so, so to kind of follow up on that uh, one, uh, I was listening to Dr. Chimura's talk. I wondered how many of these companies really mean big data as opposed to data, okay? Whether you're talking about tiny data, medium data, uh, uh, big data, you need, you need the same skills. You need the visualization, you need statistics as somebody mentioned there. So, so let me ask the three of you, and you, you kind of touched on this just now, um, uh, Gary. W w let me ask, what is it, what are the skill sets that specifically apply to big data? Because I found in teaching advanced undergraduates and even very talented graduate students, you show them a graph, you know, that has three variables on it, and most of these have never looked at this before. They, they went through college, you know, in a good university um, in a science, they never had to look at a graph. They memorized terms. They memorized, you know, all kinds of concepts and things. Hopefully, they understood these. And then you say, "What does this graph mean?" Duh. Okay. So that's not big data. That's just looking at a graph. That's little data. So what is it about big data that's special that you said you need a skill set? Because uh, because my guess is that, that that a majority of workers coming out joining industry don't even know data. Forget about big data. What's special about big data that you need? So. Uh, so Gil started this uh, in the earlier uh, Q&A session uh, about when you don't have the technology to handle the data you need, then it's big data. Or you don't have the technology to handle the format of the data that you need. We're doing a lot more with unstructured information today, which is a form of the, it's the variety of you know, the third V, right, uh, of the big data. Uh, and the fourth one that we tend to add is veracity as well, because as you get to bigger data sets and, and open data and social media data, you now start to get a type of data that we traditionally don't work with as much as, for example, financial data, where you can trust the data. So now the question is, how do you analyze that data to make it useful? Uh, but I think the foundation and the point that you're driving at is first you have to get to the point that you're comfortable with data data, data analysis, data processing. 
then you can talk about how do we deal with the big data uh, and how, or how do we talk about the unstructured data, how do we talk about the video uh, and some of the uh, data that we're using in national security, for example. Uh, the, there's been some studies out about firms uh, that show that if a firm does data-driven decision-making, what they call DDD, they have five to six percent higher return on investment than a firm <coughs> that aren't based that aren't making their decisions based upon data. So we need to get the firms, we need to get the agencies, we need to get companies all around to do things in a more quantitative, analytical method. And as you know, at GW, we conducted a seminar two years ago uh, now with uh, the Decision Sciences uh, Department about can you have uh, MBAs that are soft skill MBAs anymore. And I think the conclusion there was that you need hard science, whether you're going to become a marketing person or a finance person uh, or, you know, management science, they all now are going to be driven by data. And we have to have the skills coming from our universities. Uh, and even within our companies, we're working very hard to upskill all of our people to be more data focused and data as part of their job. Kid, you want to say anything about what skills you might need in your field for big data? Yeah, I think the, special. <clears throat> I think Chris's results um, from industry really hit those skill sets pretty nicely, starting with visualization, algorithms. Uh, some of the terms weren't quite as skill set oriented as I'd like. Things like big and distributed data. I'm not sure what that means. If you need to organize big data, if you need to move it around, presumably that's some kind of scripting capacity, scripting ability. But I think we, you know, this is where if we're gonna if we're gonna grow a workforce in big data for big data, uh, we need to sit down as educators and as business partners and 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 really define a good skill set and figure out how we can get these kids these skills so that we can uh, put kids on the market um, with those skill sets. I think the other the other important thing is not just the skill set, but the other thing that businesses look for is experience. And if we can if we can partner with businesses to develop internship opportunities in big data with these kinds of skill sets that we're trying to get uh, get these kids involved with and then get them in real situations where they're manipulating real data, where they're practicing, it makes for a great partnership because the industry gets first pick at the uh, at looking at some of these new talents coming down uh, down the pipe, and the kids get great experience working with real problems with real people in an industry environment, because at academics, you know, it turns out undergraduates and graduate students, for that matter, get really good experience in academics because that's all they know, <laughs> that's all they see. They know what that life looks like. What they don't know is is how much fun uh, and interesting the corporate world could be. And if we can get them into those kinds of internships and partnerships with companies so that they can see the opportunities that there are in industry, then, then I think uh, we can make some real good, real good partnerships there. Just as a side note, those top two, Chris, on your, on your list, visualization and algorithms that, that did not, visualization dropped on the educators and algorithms was like almost all the way to the bottom. The first two hires I made uh, in the Computational Biology Institute one is a guy in visualization, and the second is a guy in algorithms, right? So um, I'm glad to see my, my thought process aligns with industry pretty well. <laughs> um, I would say just echoing the, the comments of the um, statistician over there, um, <laughs> the, the, uh, um, all, all data are biased. Right? And when you have big data, you still have bias in your data. The law of large numbers we learn as undergrads is the more, the more observations you have, the error goes to zero. But that's not, um, that's not a safe assumption, right? So you have big data, and so you have lots of people walking around with electronics on their hip, and so you have massive amounts of data, but it's biased. You have massive amounts of Twitter but it's biased because you're not actually, you're not measuring the population, you're measuring the population of people who use Twitter. It's different than the population, right? So, so what do we need in terms of skills? We need empiricists. We need people who understand scientific method, have empirical skills, and know how to ask the right question of data, 
know how to interpret the results, know how to detect the bias and adjust for the bias and draw the right conclusions. That's what we need. Okay, let's get into the specifics of the kind of training. Uh, so let's have this kind of hypothetical situation. If you had a son or daughter about to enter college and they hear the term big data and they know you're in this panel, and you come home and they say, uh, daughter says, uh, Dad, what should, I, what should I study in college to get a great job in big data? What's the answer? <laughs> so, uh, a, a, a true confessions here. Uh, I have a son uh, who was uh, majoring in aerospace engineering. Uh, as we saw what the NASA budgets were doing, uh, <laughs> he decided, uh, with a little bit of coaching, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, maybe he should move over towards uh, more of the data science role, the uh, analytics role. Uh, and he's now at uh, George Mason University where they have an SEOR, System Engineering and Operations Research Department, where he's focusing on that. He's all excited about what IBM and the industry is calling cognitive computing. How many of you have heard of cognitive computing? A few of you. Okay, so how many of you have heard of the Watson computer that played Jeopardy? Almost all of you, right? So that's a form of cognitive computing, what we're calling, which is the next revolution as we see it in this whole field of computer science. And being a neuroscientist uh, from the background, it's all about how do you build computer systems that function more like the brain functions yeah. with neurons and synapses and all this, which has a lot of information theory associated with it, a lot of neuroscience ideas that you want to try to put into computers, right, to make them do things. Yeah, so, and we're very excited, GW, to be partnering with you and, and with Watson. So and, we're, and, we're looking forward to that. And, uh, and I do want to give a shout out to GW because GW is the first uh, area, uh, first university in the region uh, to start a master's in analytics, uh, master's of science analytics in their school of business. And uh, Dr. Prasad is someplace in the audience there who's led the uh, initiative there. Uh, but you also have George Mason coming on this fall uh, with uh, their uh, Masters of, uh, of Data Analytics as well. Uh, it's a cross-department uh, effort uh, there. And uh, Georgetown uh, is, is active both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, I think, you know, some have said this is the sexiest job. I'm not sure it's necessarily the sexiest job. Uh, <laughs> but it's certainly one of the most interesting jobs, and it lets you get into you know, either from a neuroscience side or the, you know, the physics, the Large Hadron Collider uh, work is, is uh, more of the physics side of things. The, the new uh, Astron uh, radio telescope uh, is, is on the astronomy side. Uh, and in this region, we have a lot of marketing firms that are doing marketing analytics. Uh, so it spans a, a lot of different fields. So Gary, what would you advise your son or daughter? I've got two daughters. Um, and, uh, and I'm, like any good economist, I'm trying to bribe them with money. <laughs> um, it works. And uh, so I, I had them create Khan Academy accounts, and I told them for every um, milestone that they achieve in coding, that I would give them $20. <laughs> so... Uh, so the, the, the obvious answer to that is um, I, w I want my kids to learn how to tell a computer how to do something directly. So learning code, scripting languages, Python, you know, whatever it might be. Keith, you want to jump in? Yeah, I, like uh, both my colleagues here have exactly, it's not a hypothetical, right? Because <laughs> I, I have a daughter who's a junior in high school who's looking at... Um, going to college and what she should major in and struggling with this. And, and she likes math. And she said, Dad, what can I do with math? <laughs> I mean, is there anything you can do with math? Because I don't want to do that computer science thing, because that just doesn't seem fun at all. But uh, what can you do with math? So I got out my computer and I showed her all the I'm an IBMer commercials. <laughs> all right. I said, this is what you can do in math. Anything you want. <laughs> you can change the world with math. It's that simple. So um, those are the kind of skill sets that, that, that we look for in information technology, right? That's, that, that's the kind of skill set you need. Um, I also have a, a son who's... Uh, 
I, in fact, last weekend I was in at, in Utah. He just graduated from the University of Utah with a combined match, master's and bachelor's degree in computer and in mechanical engineering. And I tried desperately to get him interested in bioengineering, but he claimed that was totally uninteresting. <laughs> but he's doing robotics, uh, and as far as I can tell, he is like like neuroscience computing. Right. That is computational biology, right? right? That it. So, um, <laughs> but he's. Uh, he graduated, I talked to his, some of his professors that he was working with and they all commented on his, his programming skills, right? So uh, in, in especially mechanical engineering, computer programming isn't necessarily a skill set that, that they develop there. But because we, my wife and I grew up in Michigan, so we spent our summers in Michigan driving from Utah to Michigan, you know, which is a 24 hour drive. And this kid would literally sit in, in the back of the car with a programming in C book and read it for 24 hours, figuring out how to program and then get there and do some stuff. And he self-taught him, uh, him self-programming over the summers as a high school kid, got to college, took a few more programming classes, found out it was useful, and he's been the go-to guy uh, for a lot of the mechanical engineering folks because it turns out that to do a lot of this stuff you need to have some programming experience. You need to have that skill set. So bribing the kids to do con is is a really good idea <laughs> and I think I'll steal that with my uh, younger kids. And because that the programming skill set, the, the math analytical background skill set, those are just critical skill sets to have. And uh, to encourage kids to get, get those, that basic foundation then really allows them to, to go into any of these areas. Because we all have our pet areas that we think are the, the coolest thing ever. And, and, um, and I think having that base skill set allows kids to, to really not only go into their specific areas of interest, but to excel in those areas of interest because they have these, this broad skill set of uh, and really requisite skill set in today's world of programming and, and some solid math background. I want to raise two more points and then we'll open up for discussion. Uh, it sounds like a chatty group from the previous uh, <laughs> session. So, so, uh, so here's a simple thing. Should universities offer a degree or a certificate in big data analytics? Would that be a good thing for, for, for the person and for the company? In some ways, you could say that's a kind of a narrow focus. You don't want somebody saying, my degree is in visual, visualization, you know, because if that field dies, you're, you so, haven't got much to fall back on. And, uh, so in some ways, you could say, if you had a very bright student come to you uh, who's majored in English and doesn't know much about grass, but but really brilliant kid, that kid may be better than somebody who's got a degree. So so what are your thoughts about it? Should, should there be a focus? A focus to that degree that, that GW has a big data and analytics degree or, or certificate. So what, what do you think, Frank? We are encouraging, and, and GW did, the, uh, an analytics degree. We're not calling it big data. We're not focusing specifically. And the professional society for the, the INFORM society, which is the operations research society, is focusing on this broader topic called analytics. Uh, in fact, they have a certificate program now called the Certified Analytics Professional Program. Uh, and that includes something about big data, that is some of the how do you handle really big data sets or, or really big unstructured pieces of information. Uh, but it also includes all the basics, including statistics and probability and, and sort of everything there. And I don't think we all know where the field is going to go and, and what is big today will be small tomorrow. So I think the broad is good. Uh, but I'd also like to say that we all as professionals want to keep doing analytics work and therefore we need customers that appreciate how analytics and data can be used in their field. So it's not just that we need to be professionals, but we need the people in anthropology uh, or something, environmental science, to appreciate the value of the data within their fields and I know that GW and the other schools are getting more data intensive uh, in everything that they're doing, uh, and certainly in the geno genomics area for healthcare. Uh, you know, much more data is in healthcare now than ever before. So, Gary, you came from a very different field. Should there be uh, a specific degree in this? 
I, I think for a while there should be. I think that the demand and, and the, the report that the Tamara Analytics and um, uh, you know put together I think is excellent. I think I think the demand is is massive and I like the idea. But just let me try an analogy here where think about think about software languages as a language. So if you speak um, if you if you speak French um, but you don't understand diplomacy, you can be a translator, but you can't be a diplomat, right? But if you are, understand diplomacy and speak French, you can be a diplomat, right? Um, somewhat controversial, not, ev not, not everybody you know, that I hang out with tends to agree with me on this one, but I think if, if you understand some computer languages, uh, you can implement things, but it doesn't necessarily make you a data scientist. Um, so I think we, we need to think about that aspect of the training and education. So, um, you know, bioinformatics is a really cool field. I like it. Um, but, you know, in my background in national security and law enforcement, we don't have like a law enforcement informatics type of a thing where we need to sort of combine the idea of the, the skills to, to tell, to sort of de be comfortable in the command line, tell the computer what to do, to reach back into the data, to think about the visualizations, to ask the right questions. And I think if you, if you define big data or data science degrees in, in that sense, and, and don't make them overly generic, but, but think about like a, a domain, then I absolutely endorse it. Kate, just briefly. Well, I think uh, Gary's earlier point about about this domain specific education being so important, and uh, you know, I think is right on. I, I've uh, I've worked with a lot of computer scientists uh, as collaborators that that don't get DNA, right? I mean, they're really good at parallelizing some of my software and getting it to run faster That's and right. things like that, but they don't understand the questions that we can address uh, with the data we're collecting. And I think rather than, than um, a big data degree, what we should think more about are big data skill sets. And because I think the skill sets are very similar, uh, some basic programming, some, some databasing, uh, some statistics, uh, the basic skill set is the same. And, and have that skill set um, replicated uh, across a variety of big data associated degrees that are domain specific. So you have computational biology degree, you have a neuroscience degree, you have a, a business degree, you have an analytics degree, but they're all, they all cover some of the big data skill sets, but then give you the domain specific information as well, so that they're, uh, the students then are better equipped to hit the job market with a specific set of skills uh, for specific kinds of jobs, but with that broader training, so they they have the capacity for movement and and uh, thinking about things in different ways. Okay, and then my last uh, query of the panel before the discussion is this: This is something actually that uh, Frank touched on. So big data is no doubt hot, hot, hot. Where is it going? You know, a lot of stuff that was hot, uh, and then people got into it, and then they found, oops. You know, we all remember uh, the kinds of fields that are no longer where they once were. <laughs> so, I mean, is, is it going to be the kind of thing with five, ten years from now, you'll be able to get all things put in there, and the computer does all the stuff you want these people to be trained in, and now people that are training are superfluous. Right. Well, so, so where is it going? I think that, so, I'll put you on the spot. I don't, I mean, you I don't, your, I don't. Your crystal ball. <laughs> right. Um, a, I don't think it'll be superfluous. I think what happens is that it just becomes table stakes. You know, we are not, <laughs> You know, we, IBM, and we as an industry, and probably we as a society, are not going to accept people, uh, at least if they want employment, uh, that, you know, don't have this basic knowledge, as you've, you know, pointed to, sort of the, the base level knowledge of how to manipulate data and understand data and visualize data and know what it means. So, it, as time goes on, that'll be the table stakes to do anything. And then, of course, you'll need additional kind of things, and maybe that's in the domain-specific area, or maybe that'll be in some new technology uh, like the Watson, like the cognitive kind of thing. Uh, we're just starting to work with a number of universities to try to get this whole concept of cognitive science and, and cognitive computing uh, out so, on the so table. you don't think Watson will put these people out of business? I, I think Watson's going to actually open up the economy for more knowledge-based systems uh, that'll make the economy more efficient and, and companies and, 
and agencies, uh, you know, be able to do even more than they can do today. Okay. So, so Gary, what's your prediction? Is this going to be hot, hot, hot? Yeah, um, I, I actually uh, agree that uh, the capability is going to increase the demand. It's going to. Um, I drank the Kool Aid. You know, I mean, um, the the demand is the demand is going to grow. That's a phrase. Yeah, I know. We. Uh, <laughs> I, we've, we've got, I think we've got five years of just trying to figure out what this is, okay. and I think we're just starting to, and, uh, but I think the demand is going to be there. It's a matter of figuring out what's inherently human and what the machine's going to end up doing, and I don't think we really understand that today, and I think over the next five years we'll come to terms. And how they that. work together, That's right. the synergies. Okay, you, you're taking this? I can give you a concrete example in, in my area. We, we uh, spent 13 years and $3 billion dollars uh, sequencing the first human genome. Today we can sequence uh, about 380 human genomes in a week for a thousand dollars each. Uh, big data are not going away in biology. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's open it up to uh, for questions or, or discussions from the audience. Right there. Please identify yourself before you ask the question. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning. My name is Oscar Ekmekci. I'm the interim chair for the Department of uh, Clinical Research and Leadership here at GW. And we've been listening to a lot about the definition of data and the threshold beyond which it has passed, which probably qualifies it as big. You know, data has always been around, but now it's big. And I suspect it has something to do with the limitations of the human processing side of things, the brain, the, the ability to do cognitive processing. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard artificial intelligence come into the discussion that sort of counterbalances the, the volume, the velocity, and the variety of data that we're talking about. So I'd like to hear the panel's views on how artificial intelligence is being nurtured, I would say, on kind of a parallel track with big data so that in the end this all works out. So, okay. Uh, when I went to school, uh, artificial intelligence was the big thing, and there was programs like Elijah that you may remember uh, that attempted to be artificial intelligence. And then we went into what we in the industry call the uh, AI winter. And uh, for approximately the last 20 years, people have been playing with AI and haven't really accomplished the goals that were set out uh, and the uh, euphoria uh, sort of uh, waned. Uh, but then, uh, with technology finally advancing, with machine learning advancing, with deep learning uh, capabilities, with systems such as the Watson system, we're finally getting back to the point that we can start analyzing vast quantities of data. One of the things that we discovered is, and no surprise probably to you and others, is that much of the big data has been created for human consumption. That is, in federal government, there's lots and lots of reports, lots of words written in natural language, in English. And how do you take all that information and have a computer to understand that information so it can actually do artificial intelligence based upon that information? And those are the kind of systems that we're calling knowledge-based systems uh, that we do think are the next generation of artificial intelligence and will revolutionize the field as we get these computers that can look at pictures and understand that there's a car in that picture and the car is about to hit the pedestrian or, you know, that computers can hear something and understand uh, the meaning behind that. Uh, so, you know, taking all those things that were typically human inputs uh, and now processing that to help the humans to then do uh, decision making and, and take actions. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions out there? Let me just add a little bit, because the I don't know anything about artificial intelligence, but I know I have a different definition of big data, right? And for me, big data are uh, data that jam up my internet, <laughs> my my email box, right? I mean, you you know, used to be we could just email data around, and now I literally get data sets shipped to me via, via FedEx, right? Because the 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 internet capacity to quickly move data around just simply isn't there. And, and you know, I think that's, uh, especially with um, folks from Loudoun County Economic Development around here and, 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 and the, the political rep representatives, that if you want uh, 
Northern Virginia uh, to be a big data corridor, to be the big data center that, that we all want it to be, that we really need to invest in some, some fundamental basic core internet capacity. And, you know, I'm, I live in Loudoun County, and boy, my internet <coughs> sucks. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. And, and people, it doesn't take people it, very long to figure that out and then decide that they're gonna go uh, move someplace else because, you know, if you can't uh, sit at your home on a Saturday evening and download a couple gigabytes of human genomic data, then, you know, <laughs> what's the point, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> the way I'd answer it is uh, it depends on how you define artificial intelligence. If my team puts together an algorithm that takes um, heterogeneous data and draws non-obvious inferences from it, why isn't that artificial intelligence? So I think we are doing artificial intelligence. Um, the term, I think, it does sort of, you know, Come, come around in every like seven and a half year cycles or something like that and maybe it's a Hollywood movie based or something too. <laughs> but um, but it, I think, I see artificial intelligence as being evolutionary and it's going on right in front of us. Um, and IBM is gonna sort of give us the revolutionary breakthrough any day now. But I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's going on. I think we just have to realize that everything we're talking about here today is in a sense the evolution of artificial intelligence. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you to the audience and thank you to the panel. Oh, there's one more. Oh, okay. One more. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, uh, Kelvin Duga from uh, GW uh, Physics Faculty. Um, were there? I mean, this is actually, in some sense, uh, to the survey and also to the panel. Were, were there any surprises in the survey? Odd sort of data that came back that you didn't quite. Appreciate. I understand the main findings, but any surprises? To me, to me, the the it was surprising to see the lack of alignment between what the educational folks thought was important in terms of skill sets versus what industry thought was important, and that's clearly uh, critical information that we need to fix. Right? As educators, we need to we need to better align our our skill sets with the. Uh, future employers of our students. <laughs> I think we, you know, that's something that's very concrete and was surprising to me because I would have expected those to line up better. So, I, I mean, let me just, I'll do my closing remarks, sort of, is that it's really a three-legged stool, right? We need industry to be working with universities, and to your point, Keith, we need government to be working with all, with the other two as well, because to make this the big data capital is really going to require all three groups to communicate and work together and, and you know, cross-fertilize. Thank you, uh, the panel. Uh, I would like to mention something, and that's in praise of physicists. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mistake to criticize somebody who has the podium. <laughs> in the latter part of the 20th century, uh, scientists in Europe and, and, the, and the U.S. were trying to uh, share a large num number of data sets because they were doing uh, exactly the kinds of experiments that uh, you mentioned, uh, the, the precursors to the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, they devised a system by which they could share that data. And that system in its evolution turned out to be the internet. So the physicists played a major role in, in the invention of the internet, in the utilization of the internet, and in the ideas of the of the uh, large data sets and sharing of the large data sets, um, statisticians on the on the other side. Uh, a few years ago, I received a note from uh, a very distinguished colleague of mine named Professor Singapur Walla, Nozer Singapur Walla, uh, who is a very um, uh, well-known expert in operations research, reliability, and 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 so forth. And he wrote to me and said. If in characteristically Noser fashion, he wrote and said, this is an article from a, a, you know, from a newspaper I cut out. And he had the cut, cut out of the thing in the PDF format and had uh, underlined it. Something about data sciences. And he said, um, exactly the words that, was, that were used a little earlier, said, this is now very sexy. What are you going to do about it? 
<laughs> and uh, basically, uh, what he meant uh, for us to do was to develop a program in data sciences several years ago. It was before even big data became big. <laughs> I think uh, the comment about the, st the statistics, is, of course, is very, uh, very uh, apt. And uh, I do refer you, however, to a New York Times article that came out a few years, uh, maybe over the last couple of weeks, uh, by Gary Marcus and somebody else about eight or nine things that are wrong with big data. And uh, it, it does, uh, some of the things that are wrong uh, have to do with drawing the wrong conclusions from uh, uh, observation of correlations. <laughs> so people often mistake causation and correlation, and and some of the, some of those uh, things were mentioned in that article. So statistics, by all means, that's the set uh, of of skills and knowledge that we need, uh, and we should promote that. And another thing, one other point in favor of another friend of mine who was a pioneer in AI. Um, Marvin Minsky would be very happy to know that uh, AI is coming back in, 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 in this new form. Uh, I would like to acknowledge friends of ours from George Mason University. I think I understand somebody from the office of the dean is here as well. So please give them a large, large hand for being a part of this very big initiative for this area. I appreciate your coming here.